Secretary Moniz, uh, we only have a quick 20 minutes, so I want to get down to serious things right away. You play for the New England Over the Hill Soccer League, and I understand you're playing in Dedham. You play for the Dedham, Massachusetts team. No, you're playing no. Needham. Needham, oh, excuse me. Um, that's <laughs> blame that on Andrew Gumbiner. Uh, you're playing over Columbus Day weekend. Where do people get tickets? <laughs> uh, we have a, a crowd usually of around three people. Uh, I, <laughs> so think, wanted, uh, I just want to announce this. The secretary hasn't room, been able to right. play lately, but he's going <laughs> to do right. this. So now that we have the important things out yeah. of the way, you're just back from Vienna from the annual IAEA meetings. I understand there were two big parts to this. Mm -hmm. One uh, on really looking at verification and monitoring arrangements on the Iran deal, which, in which you were, uh, according to the president, the secret weapon. Uh, and also civil nuclear issues. Can you take us and sort of tell us as you come back, what do you think you got right on the Iran deal? What do you think we didn't get right? Well, frankly, I think on the nuclear side, we, we got it right. Uh, the uh, uh, Iran's uh, nuclear program is uh, dramatically scaled back as the agreement uh, required. Uh, this provides confidence, uh, especially based upon the additional transparency and verification measures uh, confidence for the international community and certainly Iran's neighbors uh, that there will be no uh, nuclear weapon uh, activity and if there is that we'll know it and we'll have plenty of time uh, to respond. So that's, uh, that's I think uh, going, uh, going, going quite well. The IAEA, uh, which is the International Inspection Agency uh, in Vienna, uh, has done a terrific job uh, and they have now issued three reports. Uh, they do quarterly reports uh, that uh, have confirmed that Iran is complying with the with the nuclear requirements. So, you know, we have, we keep working at it, uh, and there's no secret. I mean, we also, I was also able to meet with my Iranian counterpart in, in Vienna uh, because we all want to keep tracking uh, the agreement and, uh, and also seeing to it that Iran's entry into the international marketplace uh, is, is according, according to the agreement. Do you feel we've reached a state of play with Iran now that trust is beginning to, to build, or do you feel that distrust needs to be the currency of the day when we, when we look at our relationship with them? Well, we have to remember that the, uh, this, the agreement that we have is, is on one issue, uh, which is the nuclear weapons, nuclear uh, peaceful uses of, of nuclear energy right. issue. Uh, there, uh, the fact that we've gone uh, through three IAE reports successfully, you know, clearly gives us some degree of comfort, but I do want to caution. Uh, we are eight months uh, into the implementation of something that has uh, requirements that go 10 years, 15 years, 25 years, uh, not to mention the additional protocol, uh, which gives the IAEA access to any suspicious site goes on forever. So, you know, we are at the beginning, I think, of a, of a, of a long process, um, which of course means that not only Iran, but the international community, the agency, the United States, uh, the government, we need, to, we need to sustain our attention to this for a, for a very long time. Now, having said that, we cannot forget that the trust issue is uh, linked up to a lot of other uh, activities of Iran that we clearly have major problems with. Uh, <clears throat> support of Hezbollah, uh, Iran's uh, uh, military activity in, in uh, other regional countries, the human rights questions. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, obviously the hostility to Israel is a, is a, is a core, uh, shall we say, irritant, to put it mildly, in our, in our relationship. So there's, there's a long way to go. It's frankly, uh, to me, um, uh, the deal stands on its own. Success, hopefully, in this proscribing their activities to purely peaceful nuclear activities. But obviously, we hope that it will be one contributor mm -hmm. to what is probably a decadal uh, kind of a march you, I towards give, a stronger I give relationship. Give the audience a feel for how fun your job is. Um, we, we traveled, uh, I want to uh, disclose, I traveled for two days with the secretary. I'm doing a, a bit of a profile on how Ernie Muniz um, dealt with different dimensions of the DOE mission and role. Uh, part of it is in looking at renewable energy. Part of it is in looking at environmental issues and climate change and figuring out how you bring these together. But we went into 
uh, what I understand was a shallow underground lab. I'm sort of disappointed you dressed like this today because we were dressed in these mm -hmm. kind of full white containment suits and we went to see uh, these folks that grow copper. Now, I don't want to get into the technical details unless you do, but tell us about what that shallow underground lab does and why that helps us not have to deal so much with at least some element of the trust issue with Iran. Well, so let me say, first of all, let me identify the laboratory. Yeah. This was the uh, Pacific Northwest Laboratory in Washington State. Uh, it's one of our network of 17 laboratories. I just want to say on the record, it's, uh, Senator Maria Cantwell thinks it's one of the worst named national labs ever because no one knows it's there. Um, this is true. The, uh, yeah. the Cascade Mountains turn out to be a rather impermeable barrier, uh, <laughs> including for, for uh, information flow, apparently. Uh, but the um, uh, Pacific Northwest Laboratory was one of our seven laboratories that was engaged uh, throughout the Iran negotiations, providing technical support. Now, what that laboratory in particular did, and uh, Steve looked terrific, uh, in this white suit, because we couldn't tell who was in there. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, this particular laboratory uh, does contribute to uh, uh, can contribute to our Iran verification issues. I want to emphasize it's much broader than that. Right. Uh, it's for uh, monitoring nuclear tests that may occur somewhere in the world, like one a couple of weeks ago, uh, et cetera. So this laboratory. In particular, what it does, it has extraordinary capabilities to detect the most minute samples of nuclear materials. Mm. And this is where what, and what Steve is the proud possessor of is a little bit copper of the world's, the world's purest copper. Uh, so it's all about purity, and that's in fact one reason why it's, why it's underground. It was, it was a fascinating journey, and I, and I think that one of the things that you go into and you sort of look at, I don't know, isotopes, it, it made me wonder what, uh, and I, I want to ask you sort of a big question before I get to another, your, a new report you're listening today, is the role of science and having someone, you're a nuclear scientist, and we've seen others, technologists in past administrations, Harold Brown comes to mind, David Packard of Hewlett Packard, uh, uh, John Deutsch, uh, one of your colleagues at MIT, uh, Bill Perry, uh, but we don't always have science and technology wedged into the cabinet at your, at your level. And I'm interested, you know, when, when you're not wearing the Obama administration hat and you're looking back, do you worry that we're not uh, positioned well to have a pipeline of people like you serving public policy in public policy roles that have this profound, deep science capacity? Uh, Steve, let me first uh, make a different point and then come to your question. If I just my say, question was not great. No, no, no. The <laughs> question was terrific. The question is terrific and very important. Uh, but I just wanted to say yeah. that uh, since you started this off with how much fun I have doing yeah. different things, uh, at the laboratory when we visited it, of course, we saw this laboratory, which is part of our nuclear security mission. Right. But I remind you, you also saw some pretty spiffy stuff on the, yes. ele on the electric grid. Uh, you saw a laboratory that is applying science in new ways to cleaning up the environment. Uh, uh, and, of course, you saw some very basic science. So and you some saw carbon sequestration <coughs> stuff. Carbon Biomat, sequestration, yeah. yes. So, uh, really, it's a, uh, our department has a, an array of responsibilities. Again, our whimsical description, you've heard it before, mm -hmm. weapons and windmills, quarks and quagmires. But through it all is a science and technology right. thread for which our 17 laboratories are a major part of our, of our capacity. Now, talking about science and technology as a thread through all of these missions, I think, does come to your question. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, first of all, I would say that, you know, this may be, uh, I may not be the most objective uh, person, but uh, uh, having some real technical foundation as part of the cabinet, I think really does add an important dimension to the cabinet. I mean, the president, as you say, recognized mm -hmm. in this particular uh, uh, area. But I want to say I'm, I'm not the only theoretical physicist in the cabinet. Ash Carter, uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, uh, started out as a, uh, as a theoretical physicist as well. Uh, and uh, he, So as, how many as did theoretical I, physicists are out there waiting to get into the next cabinet? I would say about a million. No, uh, no, uh, no. The, so, so let, I was going to say that. So what happens here is we have theoretical physics careers, but in my case, for example, in 1977, I did a kind of a little side work 
uh, involving nonproliferation. Well, so it establishes a foundation, uh, and then serendipitously that can get drawn upon later on. Similarly, Ash uh, got drawn into arms control issues as a, phys as a young physicist, mm -hmm. and that sets a career trajectory. So rec recognizing this, what we are doing, it's not just physicists, but you find now many programs, okay, I'll say MIT because obviously I know it right. the best. Uh, so we have, for example, a technology and policy program, which brings in students, uh, uh, graduate students, typically masters. Many of them go on to um, uh, PhDs, but mm -hmm. come in at the master's level, and they come in with technical degrees and then have education in what you call the tools of policy. Right. Uh, and uh, so we are actively trying to create this kind of a pipeline. AAAS, um, uh, American Association of Advancement of Science, they have fellowships so that scientists will go young, spend a year uh, as an intern in Congress or, or in the administration. Uh, I would just say in the TPP program, as an example, um, the, one of those students, I'll say her, okay, her name is Lara Pierpoint. Mm. Uh, she was a physicist, undergraduate, uh, UCLA, came to TPP, became a PhD student, became my PhD student. Mm. She's my last PhD student, uh, and she is currently at the Department of Energy doing really excellent analysis, soon to go out into the private sector, but that's an example of someone who's clearly going to be I think probably between the public and private sectors for her career. One year ago, you and I um, talked about, we, we interviewed sort of what cool things are out there, what sort of, I mean, I sort of always feel I'm, I'm with, you know, some, you'd make a great technical advisor on either future James Bond movies or end of the world <laughs> movies with Morgan Freeman. But you know, when you're, <laughs> you're, you know, you're, you're in, uh, uh, we were talking about revolution now <laughs> and looking at, uh, mm -hmm. A number of things that were just trends that were happening that were that were, you know, very surprising to me at the time. And solar, and LED, and wind, and the whole the whole picture that it changed dramatically. You're you're just issuing right now, and I should tell you, I think that the, your team has reports out. Mm -hmm. uh, just moments ago, the the we got the official word that you released the update of this Revolution Now report. Uh, on, called the future arise for five clean energy technologies. So in about one minute, give us the update of what's changed in the last year. So uh, the, the message is that the clean energy revolution uh, has too often uh, always assumed to be something that will come uh, always in 10 or 20 more years. And the message here, obviously, look around, it's happening right now. You'll see it, you'll see it everywhere. So the message is that for these particular technologies, uh, land-based wind, photovoltaics, both at large scale and on rooftops, uh, electric vehicle batteries, uh, LED lighting that uh, kind of like raise the headlights. Uh, since 2008, the costs of these technologies have dropped from between 41 to 94 percent. What's new this year is, you know, every year those numbers have increased and the deployment, consequently, has gone up really dramatically. Mm. Like, I think on LED lighting, uh, the amount of deployment now, it's about 200 million, is more than double what it was at the end of 2015, at the end of 2014. So that is a one hell of a deployment rate. Uh, and, and the same is true if you look at wind, you look at, at, at solar. Uh, solar is now up to uh, if you combine uh, rooftop and, uh, and uh, utility, we're up to 25,000 megawatts. Uh, wind is 75,000 megawatts. So you look around, you know, you see wind turbines, you see all these solar installations. You see, hopefully you have in your house, where you see LED lighting, which, is, which is, requires one-sixth of the energy of the, light, the incandescent light bulb you threw out, et cetera. So that's the message. Yeah. And then if you look at this report, it's on our website, it should be by now. You will also find a few snippets of the next revolutions. So uh, tell us all about big area additive manufacturing. It sounds so exciting. All right. Uh, Not uh, too much. Well, who it, does your marketing? If you said if you if you said it by the acronym BAM, it would sound more <laughs> exciting. You see, uh, the. Uh, 
So <laughs> big area additive manufacturing, sometimes it's called 3D printing. Uh, that's one of the many areas where we invest in advanced manufacturing technologies. Uh, we do it because it's going to be very important in the energy industry, but it's going to be important more, more, more broadly. Now, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, mm -hmm. uh, you typically see for rather small gadgets uh, that you print. Big area means we are now pushing our Oak Ridge Laboratory, in particular as a leader in this, in being able to print very large structures. Mm. So for example, uh, the hottest ticket uh, in the uh, Paris uh, climate change meeting last, uh, last December in the demonstration pavilion was the printed Shelby Cobra, uh, for example. Mm. I can see vaguely, many of you are old enough to remember the Shelby Cobra, mm. uh, which had its 50th anniversary last year. Uh, but now uh, the new announcement, mm. and by the way, we are talking about 90 plus percent improvements in the energy required per mass of a manufactured component. That's right. why energy efficiency is a big driver here, uh, give us also a competitive edge uh, in, uh, going forward in manufacturing. Uh, now we just produced the world's biggest piece which will be part of Boeing's design uh, in, its, in its future manufacturing. So it's a big deal. You know, I want to tell people, th this is uh, you know, not to, to be promotional to DOE, but it is fascinating. And if you go to the back part of the report, which I've had a privilege to look at, there are fascinating, very diverse sets of technologies that are coming online. I wish we had a, a couple more hours to discuss this. Can I mention just one this. more? Yeah, just Can really, we'd see that very, block there. So oh, two minutes, we've got to make it short. Ve yeah. So very quickly, another one that's in there, and just two weeks ago parked in front of DOE was one of the four so-called super trucks. These are the big class These, eight vehicles, right. which take up a tremendous amount of our fuel use. Are they uh, lightweighted? And the light, light weighting is, mm -hmm. is, is a big part of it. There's many features, 88% improvement in fuel economy. Wow. And wow. we're going to be going up past 100. Um, two quick things in our last two minutes. One, uh, we visited in Seattle the Bullet Center and we saw how synthesizing waste and water and air and smart systems and computer and, and the Bullet Foundation, for those of you who have ever been to Seattle, it's extraordinary. What really impressed me was the opportunity for conservation of energy of existing buildings that were coming in. I just want to just take a snap, you know, give us a quick snapshot of what you saw. Well, so the, the Bullet Center. Uh, in Seattle uh, is what's called a living building. Uh, by the way, for context, buildings in the United States take up about 70% of our electricity. So the efficiencies we saw are a big deal. Mm -hmm. First of all, it is, it is net positive energy. They overestimated how much energy they would use and built their solar, uh, uh, solar rooftop. Uh, but in addition, uh, completely self-contained in effect in terms of water. We had a very interesting uh, a meeting uh, in a bathroom, as I recall, mm. for example, uh, looking at the advanced technologies, which we can't I, describe I here. I wasn't going to uh, share that. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but also, uh, they are a big compost supplier from what's going on in the building. And as you saw, an incredibly comfortable building, beautifully lighted, etc. So this is kind of the future. Uh, this is a, li a, a it's beyond a net energy zero building, kind of a living building. We're, we're right at the end, but I want to ask you, I'm going to squeeze in two questions and cheat. Uh, is nuclear a clean energy? I know that you were discussing, nu and, and, and when you look at clean energy advocates, nuclear is not normally on their list. But I'd love to sort of see, as you look forward, is nuclear an energy that we need to trust? Is it, is it going to be a solve? And secondly, you told me this fascinating thing that, that President Modi uh, of India, uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, named the Mission Innovation Program. So 30 seconds on each. Uh, on the first, uh, uh, nuclear, first of all, it's a fact. Nuclear is responsible for roughly 60% of our uh, uh, zero carbon uh, electricity. So it's an enormous contributor. Uh, and uh, uh, I believe, especially with new technologies, like smaller modular reactors. So uh, should we feel warm will, and fuzzy about this, nuclear? Uh, I'm not asking you to feel warm and fuzzy, uh, but I am suggesting that it will help a lot in reaching the deep decarbonization that we need at mid-century mm -hmm. and beyond. This is, goes well beyond Paris targets. We're talking deep decarbonization, and the electricity sector in particular mm -hmm. uh, has to be just about completely decarbonized 
uh, to meet our overall uh, economy goals. Uh, with regard to the Prime Minister Modi, yes, it was very interesting. Uh, we, uh, uh, the mission innovation uh, goal of doubling uh, energy R&D uh, globally was being discussed. Uh, at that time, uh, we had a uh, name for it that only one of those technical people in the cabinet could love. Uh, and uh, when Prime Minister Modi heard about it, he just immediately uh, zeroed in. Let's call it mission innovation. And so was it done. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you.